is at school and I want to give you a talk about enabling UFI and payload on top of Coreboot enabled platform, which is in this case VCMG's APU2. So initially we plan to give this talk with Camille, but because uh, we get two presentations, we decide to split that and Camille will focus on TPM and I will show you the UFI stuff. So who we are? I'm the owner of 3MD, a Poland-based uh, embedded system consulting company. Uh, we are former Intel employees. We worked on uh, server BIOS, uh, especially with uh, any, any interface. So we know a little bit about that, but we will not talk publicly about that. We are switching to working on PC engines, platforms, and supporting that. Okay, feel free to contact us or feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions during this talk. So, in God's name, why? Uh, so, this subtitle came from um, readme.ufi from Uboot, uh, where they saying about enabling Uboot on top of EFI. Uh, and yeah, of course, if you get this idea, then you have to ask this question. Um, but it looks like customers asking for that. Um, and also there are ideas of enabling um, UFI, our operating system, on top of core boot, or you can say you want to boot Debian aware, web aware on top of PC engines. There are also other things that you may want to use. For example, you may want to use uh, Memphis 86 Pro version, uh, which has EFI uh, binary. Um, this can be useful, for example, for ECC um, training. Um, you might want also to use some other tools or exercise some uh, forensic tools or maybe some exploits, maybe look for some bugs in Tiano Core, which should be easier if you have access um, from Coreboot side and from, from UFI shell side or UFI our operating system side. Also, there are some optional ROMs which contain uh, just UFI drivers and without uh, UFI we are not able uh, to run, to make these devices work. So, yeah, there are also runtime services um, that we want to exercise and we can play with that more. There are also very interesting projects about team hypervisors, uh, which provide also for Xenix uh, um, support for analysis of Windows and if someone is interested in that, this is a good way to go. So, what I want to present, like a brief history of Tiano Core payload, um, there is not much information there, but uh, <laughs> that I want to tell what I found. Um, payload components, um, what, you, what steps you should take while porting, um, what's PCD and why we use it, uh, why you should not always trust datasheet, uh, and for example, how to enable UFI, what PCIe or PCI issues we, we faced, and what they tested we did, and what will be next steps. So it looks like his story started with attempt on Google Summer of Code in 2010. The idea probably were in community before that, um, but th the first idea was from one of the students who did some loading uh, tries but didn't succeed. Then a couple years nothing, and in 2014 it looks like someone have instructions for building a uh, core boot payload package in UFI and then in 2015 first commits were sent, were sent but right now uh, development is not so active like last year 61 patches and this year just 6 so not much happened there Okay, so what's inside? Um, so we have a core boot payload package and core boot and model package. Uh, first, we have um, mm, graphical output protocol, uh, which right now, um, according to what I heard from Ron, is they moving to PEI, 
um, so they want to probably provide it also in a FSP package. Um, uh, there's ACPI timer which provide um, information about uh, which provide API for, for delays and performance counters. There is a PCI host bridge uh, which have helped us for initializing getting free resources. Boot manager uh, which provide boot menu handling and um, platform quickly you can you can provide your code that is for platform specific. And Reset system we uh, provide functions to Reset and move into S3 and S5 as of state. The core boot module package, uh, we have SecCore, this little bit of assembly there, and like one function you see, this is this enabling source code debugging. Uh, PEI, CP support PEI, um, this is just taking the core boot uh, table and pack it into hope to provide it to Dixie. Then there is CP support Dixie, uh, which uh, extracts SMBIOS and ACPA tables and install those tables, like report IOs and MMIOs to Dixie Core. There is also SATA controller. I didn't so use of that, but it could support the uh, IDE protocol, so pretty legacy stuff. There is serial, uh, which supports um, 16550 compatible UART devices. Um, there is Parsley for core boot table parsing and and like some uh, lead to customize Dixie, Dixie face. So um, how booting looks like? So we, we started with our um, ROM stage, run stage, then we um, hand over to, uh, to SEC, which just have very little code and like finish very very fast. Then we switch to PEI, which I already told what it does. Then we have bloated Dixie uh, with 50 modules, uh, which are not all needed, probably. A bunch of them can be removed. For APU2 platform, uh, the situation was that uh, um, frame buffer, graphic drivers, not initialized. There are various protocols here. For example, like uh, Consplitter PC um, provides uh, ability to split the console to serial and to um, to video, but this is not needed. FAT, not everyone used that. Um, that there is uh, an ATAPI stuff, which is also kind of a gas. So, a bunch of that that can be removed, um, but also probably. Exercising that, we can find some bugs and and maybe exploit that. So after these 50 modules load, you can run shell application, and we have some problem with that. Also, we have some couple couple asserts um, that some of them we fixed, some of them not. So. Um, The boot time, this, this is just, I measured that just by using serial console timestamp, so this is not exactly precise. precise. Uh, so probably the error here is quite big, and the uh, measuring was done on debug, but if you see what's going on here, we have like almost 10 seconds in Dixie. These are these 50 modules loading. Um, Okay, so what you should consider when trying to um, enable Cant or Payload if you really want to do that. Uh, first, um, it's good to automate stuff um, always. So um, it's time consuming, you spend a lot of time compila compilation, providing image, flashing, and then booting and checking that, okay, the asset is again there. Yeah? So, like, for sure, all Python. Uh, um, scripts are helpful here. Um, very useful is checking what's already there. And uh, it happened that it's not so obvious because marketing of changes in, in RE, <laughs> that area is not so good. So it happened that I tried to solve some problems that are already solved, uh, but patches were hidden somewhere. <laughs> 
and just apply it during uh, Tianacor, uh, Tianacor um, compilation inside Corbel, for example. So there are some patches laying in the um, payload external Tianacor uh, that are applied there. And I started just with forking my EK2 and, and compiling, compiling it by myself. Yeah. So, um, but, but it happened also that no, yeah, if I apply all those patches, it doesn't work for me. So um, I have to like check that which are good for me, which are which are not. Um, next up, next up is uh, understand the corporate tables um, and what what you get in there. There, in, like corporate payload um, developers assume a lot. This was prepared for. Uh, minimum board marks and they just hard code some addresses so uh, this can cause some problems and sometimes you might even have a need for passing some additional information from core group to uh, Tiana code because you cannot obtain that easily uh, or you don't know how to do that because it's too complex yeah? PCDs, um, this is also interesting uh, like they, they invent um, variables, like five types or six types of variables. I would know about that. Um, you can use those for various reasons, like enabling, disabling uh, um, access to MMIO, um, enable serial, and various, various things. Target UFI, um, shell booting, so um, you, you need. Depends what you need, but typically you want to start with, with shell. You, know, you want to put shell and then from that you can go to some UFI aware operating system or, or try and test or any UFI application. And, and what's important with having uh, serial and working is understanding of con in, con out and error out concept. Okay, so PCBs. So, like, we have types of PCBs. Like, there are build time uh, and runtime. Build time we set in in DSC file, um, and we um, have different types of build time. Uh, you can see that we have feature flags and fixed fixed at build time. The different is like you know I don't know why they did that, but the the feature flag can be true false and uh, the fixed that build time can be any constant, so we can put some addresses there. Um, then you have um, patchable in module uh, flag, which is which is runtime flag, and uh, it's default to some to some value, but then you can modify that. So um, there are also dynamic default and dynamic mm, x default, ex default. This can be modified, and they are set. They are kept in flash. Um, so every time you put it, it's, it's loaded. You can modify that and put. And you know there are other like VPD or uh, HII um, flags. HIIs are related with the uh, setup setup menu. VPD with like some vendor information that also can be stored in flash. So you can see that the difference between the two. Uh, there is no difference, like truly. The difference between um, the default and the e e EX version is, is like um, it. We have different API to access from and another, and the first can be accessed only if you build from source code and and you have translation during during building the source code. When they do the release, um, truly this. It, it cannot decode the GUID because GUID is decoded by the tools during, during building. So, so if you release the binary outside, uh, you have to use EX API to get that information. Okay, so what problems we had on PCMG's APU2? So, like RTC author, this is related with trust but verify and, and Data sheet or or SOC problem, um, um, then lack of lack of serial and console in out. 
this was very interesting because I saw the logs in uh, in Pay, I saw the logs in Dixie, but I didn't saw the, the logs in Shell. So this was weird. And then uh, Dixie answered, uh, which I didn't resolve, maybe because lack of understanding was going on. And second thing is maybe related with the, uh, with the previous one, and they have PCI. Enumeration issue, I would say, this is maybe not an enumeration issue, but uh, access issue, because I can access only through IO, not through IO. Um, okay. So, so, uh, so yeah, I cannot add memory uh, space for a LAPIC. Uh, this is uh, this is hard coded for Intel platform, and I actually try when I try and this is the same address is for when I read the MSRs to confirm that this is the same address for AMD. Uh, it's it's the same, and but trying to allocate that. Mm, gives me access to the night when I, I, I'm not sure what, why is that, if there is any protection for that memory. Um, so I just ignore that and boot, boot continues, yeah. But yeah, well, if any have idea of what's going on and uh, how to solve that, I would be glad to hear. So next thing was um, was problem with um, valid RAM and time bit in RPC register. And this uh, this bit should be set on on boot and should be read only, but it happened it is not read only, and initialization of the re register uh, just overwrite that bit. This was quite easy to to find, but I scratch my head because I cannot believe that I'm reading data sheet and say it's read only. Uh, all the other RPC chips have this bit read only, but but GX for 12 TC in APU to SOC obviously not. And you know I don't know if this is data sheet problem or silicon problem, um, but this was fixed. Um, then you have to choose your shell because you know after that I was able to finish the Dixie phase. And try to get into um, into UFI, but nothing happened. I, at least I didn't saw anything. So, so I because by default um, we're using core boot payload use binary package. I had to find a way to try to modify the UFI shell call to see what's going on during load. But even when I did that, I didn't saw any any logs. But just to let you know that there are various types of U UFI shell. Um, like this is the same, but yeah. But you can build yourself from from code. If you give build shell flag, then you can attach the full beam. But this is legacy stuff. This is EDK um, previous previous version of EDK. Um, binary version, there is minimal version which is which not have all the commands and uh, there is uh, UFI bin which is binary version but with all you can you can also build without UFI shell and this is changed in DSC file um, for, for core boot payload package So what's about uh, con in, con out, and error out? So because APU2 do not have uh, video output, uh, we need to provide logs to serial. Uh, but as I said, there was no no logs on serial in UFI shell. And I wrote email to uh, EDK mailing list and Lashro explained me that it's probably a problem with Con splitter, uh, con splitter Dixie cross splitting a serial to video and to serial console, and it didn't saw the device path for the serial device, and because of that, uh, probably sent tried to send to video, but there was no video. So, so I had to manually add the information about the about serial. So con in, con out, and there are other global breaking rules, um, which which are non-volatile, and you can uh, modify those uh, both in boot time and runtime. So this is system can change that. 
So, in the interval stages, I saw the logs because of uh, I use different methods. There are, there are two ways of accessing the console. The constructor one uh, issues one, and there is other through, directly to server port library, which is used in PDI and Dixie face. So, I have to up up, which is something like that. Uh, the, the number here inside is um, GUID um, from Dixie, uh, serial Dixie driver, uh, which initialize um, serial. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the stack um, how serial is called in uh, UFI. Yeah? So we have four layers, or maybe five if you count the base serial port lib. So basically, a port, port lib works on I/O and MMIO level, uh, and it provides capability to read write uh, um, 165.50 compatible UART devices. Um, so this lib utilizes um, um, Dixie to produce two protocols. There are two protocols which gives ability to access this I/O um, and yeah, and abstract that to higher layers. And you can see here that. Um, from serial uh, port lib, uh, I, there are typically there are many functions, but I just give in, give you a couple. Like we have serial port initialized, and on next level we have serial dix, dix initialized, and on next level we have initialized the terminal. On shell there is no initialization; it's already initialized. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, there are also um, function for reading and writing the. Okay, and then of course we, we need in shell, um, we need correct path to uh, serial Dixie uh, to, to be able to output this the information uh, in shell application. Okay, so this is modification that I needed. I'm, I'm not deeply understand that. I know that this is this is mostly like copy paste from ARM. ARM had the same problem because uh, it's like it cannot find the device, the serial device. So they just adding the um, uh, path to UR device, which is kind of hard coded, and path can be also not only to hardware but can be also through drivers. You know? And there is this serial mix driver that they use. In and you can see that um, there is first node is a vendor a device called Serial Dixie. Then we have UR device. This finally look like like that, yeah. Then HW and so on. And you can also provide parameters further here. And these parameters for serial device are provided through PCDs. Uh, from uh, DSC file, and yeah, I know this sounds complex. <laughs> the, the one mistake that I made here, I used incorrect PCDs, so I used uh, fix it at, at build type PCDs, and this was bad because uh, because the, co the definitions of uh, um, the structures do not accept this type of PCD, and I had like very weird compilation errors. Some like deeply nested macros complain that I'm using incorrect PCD, and the, the coding is this error is, is not obvious. So I had a problem with uh, PCI enumeration. So after getting serial console, I was not able to. Uh, to see any device, um, and the problem was, I, I get some information that I should. There, there was patch already in, in, in Corbett for that, that I should just remove uh, PCI host bridge Dixie driver and use no enumeration because we already have everything enumerated, and there is two package which contain that that driver. But then after that, so this is this patch uh, 01 Corbett payload package PCI nomen and patch. But um, it also happened that my MDE module package, which I used before, also is able to, to work if I will not use 
MMIO, but just IO. And this is possible. We can do that by um, by not setting some define, which is in um, DSC package. This define is PCIe base, and by default, this define is for Intel. Yeah, so it didn't work for uh, AMD platform. Then I um, so when I set it to zero, it used different driver, the um, CFA CFC uh, driver, um, and it worked. But I was concerned. You know, I was wondering why MMI are not working, and uh, tried to figure out this. And one of the things that I did is setting up PCI base to what I see in core clock uh, to, to this value O X F eight and O zeros, and this triggers some bug in UFI like that. So we have like some assert, and obviously we have some overflow out there. Like you see, this minus a thirteen something. Yeah, so this also have to be figured out or exploited. Okay. So what we are we are able to do? We put UFI our Debian nine point two R. Uh, we run Memtest eighty six Pro uh, for various tests. We run Python and. The next position should be we run Gipsec and did some forensics, but it happened that Gipsec won't work and it loads like 20 minutes in UFI. Um, so, like, I, I will probably work on enabling Gipsec. So, I don't know if you see that. This is like proof that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can see, like, I'm proving that in a way that I show that there are. Um, I can I can all uh, call EFI boot manager to show the booting variables. Yeah, so booting variables are not in core boot, so <laughs> it's it's booted with the and APU two platform got just core boot firmware, so this has to be UFI. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is yeah, this is ARC, the same stuff, and this is Mantest uh, Pro. Um, uh, this was idea from Kiosk uh, about testing ECC, um, and you know I, I tested ECC. But the weird thing with that, I just do some small off topic here, is okay. Uh, Memphis Pro reports that ECC mode was detected, that correction works. There are other features that do not work. But what's interesting is like it should not work because, or maybe it not work, but. But just not the tech any errors um, because there is a bug introduced in Moonin's P uh, when someone tried to fix Windows 7 graphics driver, um, they broke booting APU 2. So, and, uh, and we realized that before in that version and before ECC was not correctly configured and it didn't work. So, and they fixed it after that. So, it's like Cannot use that yeah, because we cannot put our platform. So and they they add some PSP functions here. So it's worrisome. Yeah. So we will be glad to prove on PC Engine platform that ECC works, and I hope that I can do that with uh, with Memphis Pro. So this is proof that we run Python. Like we see even the Sys platform returns UFI. <laughs> So, um, so, so, what are the possible further steps? We can try to enable chipsec. I, I would be glad to enable chipsec and like have their tests against an APU platform and fix all the possible um, bugs or um, entry points for malicious behavior. Um, Look how to improve USB drivers. This is very interesting because CBOs uh, seem to not work exactly um, correct with uh, USB 3 and like USB seem to behave very weird, at least on APU 2 platform. And when I ran the UFI shell, uh, USB worked like perfectly on the same platform. I don't know why, what's the reason, <laughs> but they have like four or five drivers for USB. Um, it would be interesting to emulate secure boot and try to exercise, um, um, as I said, the, the UFI option ROMs 
Um, and there is also a gas arena that we, it would be great to get rid of. And UFI application can give us ability together with Python to faster that blob and prove that it's complete mess and we don't need it. Okay, so what's the conclusion for that talk? Uh, so I think in some way Tiananmen Corpado is useful, uh, at least to prove that it's broken, for example, or, or has problems. Um, it's not hard task, truly, maybe some more understanding of LAPI and, and x86 architecture would be good to, to move forward. Um, it may give uh, to ability to enable other devices because we have ability to load UFI uh, option ROMs and it would be great alternative for comparison of behavior if something not working on our side and we can then boot on UFI and see if we see the same behavior or different and what's, what's, what's there. Okay, so that's all from my side. Thank you. Any questions? Can you give me a minute, boss? <laughs> So if there are questions, just raise your hand right up so I can see it ah, there. Um, the work that you've done, um, do you have any patches publicly available? Yeah, so 3 of has fork of EDK2 and all the patches are there. Um, so if there will be, I, I talk with Mr. Kronbox and he, he's made, he said, he added the patches that are already in Corbett. So if there will be path on Corbett side to add patches, I would be glad to help with that. But right now it's like it's maintained in our like files and we apply that during the... Um, so I was actually in, in contact with Morris Ma and, and uh, Vincent Zimmer from Intel. They said that we can also send patches for EDK directly that way. Yeah, but I don't know if how they will react because the payload corbot uh, uh, corbot payload package seems to be prepared for Nino board, and like it's like it's like hardware dependent. So how they will react for patches like with this RPC bug? Yeah, it, this probably cannot be managed. And what what with other things that are hardware dependent? I think they're generally interested in getting it to work on more platforms, maybe as long as we don't break them no more. So, like, I, I send patches to EDK mailing list and I just get answers from Lash. So, so, if they are interested, maybe I should CC them and maybe they will do something. So. Right, yeah, oh, maybe CC me too, like, I don't know. <laughs> you will push that. <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, so, regarding the <coughs> Moolin SPI version and the PCC question, um, your slide showed two comments to PSP, and that's pretty much mm -hmm. confirmed by AMD that they shouldn't be there, but they are still oh. allowing, allowing us to do a new. Build that will fix that particular platform. Okay. So it's kind of a legal issue, but the technical reasons are there. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure what's blocking PCI engine, PC Engine's platform booting yet. So I'm concerned about, about that because I would like to prove ECC, and with, with, that change, with that change, I cannot do that, and truly, I don't know why. Yeah, and AMD is. Not support kind of those old platforms with new builds, so that's kind of a, where all the commercial uh, users of other PI blobs they should kind of come together mm -hmm. and get a new connection with AMD, especially with the new stuff going on on the uh, Chromebook side. So maybe we can get something better done with the old other PIs and keep them supported. Yeah, it would be great to revert that, that one patch just for the APU2 booting purposes. 
um, how much um, work do you think is left uh, to be done to also get chipset working and have everything in, uh, in, in a state which uh, would enable you uh, or would enable everybody to really use UEFI like it's uh, like it's native. Have you an estimate like uh, or one or two person months or is it more like years? No, I don't think so. It's years. Like it's probably if if I would know what's wrong with LabPeak and and MMIO. MMIO is not needed. Truly, you can use IO. Uh, MMIO is a just way of doing things. Then probably like this is not a lot of work. If nothing new pop up, yeah. So this is probably like I don't know, week of work or two weeks of work. But but chipsec is a little bit different stuff. They detect uh, platform version. It should work even without detecting. Uh, but right now it loads like 20 minutes. Like it's not usable on the UFI shell. So it's probably better to put uh, UFI aware uh, operating system and then try chipsec. This should probably work much better. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, what environment are you able to combine it on? Mm, what do you mean by environments? Well, sort of compiler. In uh, I use GCC v5. Okay. Seven doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, so this is typical stuff. When, when I, you know, when I worked in Intel, I tried to compile with various compilers, and like this requires work because this is like it looks like it is not validated across all advertised compilers in um, in the EDK tool. And so you can, if you will try that, you will see that most of that is broken. Uh, this isn't for your question, but an answer to the GCC compatibility. Uh, I think it was with GCC 7 where they started to use more, um, I think it was SSC 2 instructions, the wiring of your compiler options, and a lot of the corporate proper also started to fail because of stack alignment issues. Yeah, for sure, there are also bugs uh, in, in EDK that prevent more restrictive behavior of GCC, of newer versions of GCC, yeah? So if you have everything, um, you, you probably cannot compile uh, many things when you have everything as error, and one campus as error. And I have this problem with uh, Python, when I try to compile Python. <coughs> Any more questions? Going once, going twice, that one. Okay, that's a wrap. You a round of applause for. So next up is uh, lunchtime, actually. So I hope you all enjoy our grab lunch and yeah, have a nice break. <laughs>